Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. I'm joining you today from Toronto, where it is very early morning. Uh, my name is Ulfikar Bhutta. I am the founding director of the Institute for Global Health and Development at the Aga Khan University. This uh, new platform, which has been created by the university, is a multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral platform, uh, principally focused on looking at how big global issues intersect with health and how the university can engage in the geographies that it serves, which is South Central Asia, East Africa, and, and uh, with its office in the United Kingdom, in ensuring uh, scholarship, networking, and advocacy in this space. So today's session on climate change and health risks are very much aligned with the four pillars of the Institute for Global Health. Uh, the four pillars namely being the sustainable development goals and within those especially issues related to climate change and health, uh, agriculture, food security and human nutrition, uh, issues of women and children's health, particularly when it relates to issues of gender and gender equity, and importantly, uh, issues that relate to conflict settings and humanitarian emergencies. I am uh, absolutely thrilled that uh, we have a stellar panel today, uh, and uh, the panel will be sharing their views on, on climate change and human risks and uh, how these can be addressed and how they affect low and middle income countries in particular. A lot of the details on the institute of the institution, uh, the Institute for Global Health and Development, are available on our website. That would encourage I would encourage you to visit. Uh, and also, we will very soon, uh, given the charge that we have from the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, as the hub for Pakistan, be launching a network around particularly health and and uh, the SDGs. I'm. Uh, very grateful to Sustainable Development Policy Institute uh, and its leadership for having given us this platform in their conference. Uh, SDPI, as many people know, is, is the premier think tank in Pakistan related to these issues. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Ms. Osma Haroun, who is uh, uh, the director of the Sustainable Development Policy uh, 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 Conference uh, uh, Unit and the editor of the Journal of Development Policy and Practice at the SDPI. Uh, she has uh, decades of experience, over three decades of experience in media communications and has been coordinating many international conferences. She has notably worked with the UNDP's Project on Portrayal of Women in Media. Uh, uh, and I will pass the floor to her to formally give some comments on behalf of the SDPI, tell us a little bit more about the conference, and then we will get going. Thank you, Dr. Bhutta, for setting the scene. As director of the STC unit and on behalf of SDPI, a warm welcome to all the panelists and audience in today's session on climate change and health risks. This session is being organized in collaboration with the Aga Khan University, our esteemed partner in this panel. Thank you for joining us from different cities, from different regions, from different time zones. So a very good morning, assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, good evening. We look forward to inform debate on this pressing topic of, of the interaction between climate change, health risks uh, currently and beyond the pandemic. So in today's session, we look forward to hearing how partners in sustainable development can work with other global and local organizations to mount a program of research, education, and coordinated action. And I'm also looking forward to listening to some key policy recommendations, some lessons that we can take home and to the policymakers, which can make this country a healthier place for the generations to come. With this note, I, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta, Distinguished Professor and Founding Director of the Institute for Global Health and Development and Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health at the Aga Khan University. He will be moderating the session today while it is being chaired by Ms. Ruksana Naveed, who has also just joined us and she's member of the National Assembly. Welcome on board, Ms. Ruksana Naveed. 
So I'd like to hand over the mic Thank to you. Dr. Zulfagar Bhutta to carry on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Uzma. I'm really grateful at this opportunity, and I'm especially grateful to our honorable parliamentary secretary, Ms. Ruksana Naweed, who is currently also uh, serving as the parliamentary secretary of the Ministry of Climate Change in the government of Pakistan and is an honorable member of the parliament. Uh, we are always very pleased when we have parliamentarians interested in the subject. And, and Madam, we are very grateful that you agreed to chair this session despite your myriad uh, um, uh, conflicts and schedules. So I'd like to pass the floor to you to say a few words on the topic of climate change uh, and health and global risks. And then we will get going and I'll introduce the speakers and the agenda. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhutta. And very good evening, everyone who are joining with us. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me to attend this conference and I appreciate the participation from the academia, civil society, legislators and policymakers. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change is a well-established global challenge that affects multiple sectors and Pakistan vulnerability to climate change is well documented. According to the Global Climate Risk Index 2021, between the period of 2000 and 2019, Pakistan has suffered from 173 extreme weather events, placing it a global ranking of eighth among the countries most affected by the climate events. Climate change has directed direct consequences on social and environmental determinants of health, clean air, safe drinking water, sufficient food, and secure shelter. WHO 2019. The effects on human uh, health can be direct, such as heat waves and extreme climatic events, or indirectly mediated through effects of climate change on ecosystems, such as agriculture losses leading to food insecurity and subsequent malnutrition. Changing patterns of disease or change in social structures, such as migration and displacement. The already severe impact of climate change on human health are likely to increase exponentially as the use issue of uh, climate change gets worse. Key issues due to uh, climate change are floods, uh, droughts, and uh, heat waves, air pollution, impact on food safety and nutrition. Pakistan is a flood prone uh, country. That, that have caused extensive harm to life and health. Stagnant pools of uh, flood water uh, serve as breeding ground of pathogens that result in waterborne and vector-borne diseases, skin diseases, and wounds that infectious and malarial epidemics that fairly common after flooding. After the flood of 2010, 115,922 uh, cases of acute diarrhea were registered, whereas 17% of medical consultations in KPK was regarding diarrhea and diseases. 143,870 skin infections were reported in the hospitals of South Sin and 11, uh, 113,981 cases of respiratory infections were reported in Pakistan. Droughts, in droughts, we have seen that since uh, 1951 to 2010, 10 droughts of uh, varying intensities have been experienced throughout Pakistan. 31 in 23 in Balochistan, 20 and 18 in Khabar Pakhtunkhwa. Droughts greatly increase the number of mosquitoes due to increase of habitat quality. In, in heat waves, we have um, also experienced extreme uh, weather being uh, one of the deadliest zones for heat waves. Pakistan has been experiencing severe, severe heat waves during the past few decades. In June 2015, 700 deaths were reported due to heat strokes in Sindh, whereas 65,000 people were brought in the hospitals for treatment of heat stroke in Karachi alone. In May 2015, 
2018, 180 deaths were reported due to heat waves in Pakistan. And in air pol pollution, we see that the increase of incidences of numerous respiratory diseases such as asthma and bronchitis. All pollutants also affect um, pollut air pollutants also affect crop uh, yields, which is combination with climate can affect food security and public health. Approximately nine percent. 114,000 of the deaths of Pakistan are caused by air pollution. Climate change has increased the prevalence of many infectious diseases. Impact of food security and nutrition. Climate change is predicted to have substantial direct and indirect impact on food safety, causing extensive harm to human health. Changes in temperature affect the prevalence of different fungi, bacteria, viruses, parasites and their vectors, leading to increased incidences of food contamination and subsequently what uh, foodborne Ill illnesses. The ongoing epidemic of COVID-19 has drastically impacted food systems in Pakistan, increased consumer demand and decreased productivity resulted in an increase in prices of food items and impact on health due to floods life loss, property causes stress, and that affects mental health and physical health issues also. Pakistan has developed a number of laws and policies and is all, also signatory to a number of international agreements or protocols that call for adoption of mitigation measures against climate change impacts. National climate change with climate change. Further, there's a need to not only review the existing policy interventions for health and climate change, but align those well emerging con uh, context of sustainable development goals. Paris Agreement and other national and international agreements and treaties. I have also taken up uh, SDG 12, that is um, responsible consumption. And in that I'm um, introducing um, gasifier stoves which are uh, quite popular in our region because um, um, our remote areas where uh, people use uh, wood for um, as a fuel and it affects the life of the of women and children and uh, they quite are prone to illnesses uh, lung uh, lung issues and um, otherwise health eyes etc there is a need to work on following areas with an aim to strengthen climate resilient health system with, within Pakistan. Policymakers to recognize that health aspects of climate change require in interdisciplinary and multi-sectorial uh, research. Develop health information systems to, to increase monitoring of climate sensitive diseases and also to enable the climate risk vulnerability assessment for health sector. Mobilize the climate uh, financing of local, national, and international levels should be increased to enhance research regarding impact of climate change on health. Climate education is another area which need to be prioritized in medical institutions and health personnel should be educated and trained regarding cl climate change related. Develop enhance climate-focused health and education programs for climate-related health risks, including media and communication campaigns. Enable health department and public sector health institutions, regular maintenance and upgradations of basic health units, especially in remote and vulnerable areas and develop standardized emergence and stockpiling of essential medicines in advance, like in dengue uh, season, we always uh, are short of medicines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for, for your kind words. Um, we will now get on with the program. We have uh, five uh, stellar presenters, and they are all going to make relatively brief presentations, introducing and, and uh, highlighting specific areas. We will then have a, sure. a panel discussion uh, and uh, and uh, have take questions and answers from the audience. 
Uh, we are not a massive uh, a group, so I would encourage people to use uh, the hands function if they want to speak, and I'll recognize them, and I'll be hopefully able to, with your permission, Madam Chair, uh, coordinate the discussion. What I will do is uh, uh, introduce our speakers in groups uh, so that you know you can um, um, remember who's on uh, at any one time. Our first two speakers. Uh, belong to the same area of uh, in, of global uh, climate change monitoring and the Lancet process of countdown for climate action and health. And we will start with Dr. Marina Romanello, who um, is the data scientist and research fellow at the Lancet countdown tracking process on health and climate change. She hails from Argentina, trained as a biochemist, also worked at Sir Francis Crick. Institute in London, which is one of, one of the leading institutions uh, on, on cancer, uh, and uh, has had a, her PhD training in Cambridge. Uh, she researches environmental exposures and epigenetic alterations, and she'll be starting off our discussion, followed by Professor Tony Costello, who I've known and is a friend of many decades, uh, to, uh, professor Costello is the Professor of Global Health and Sustainable Development and the former Director of the Institute for Global Health at University College London. Uh, he also serves as a co-chair of the International Lancet Countdown uh, for Climate Action and Health and is a senior advisor to children in all policies, 2030 programs supported by WHO, UNICEF and the Lancet. And prior to this, uh, Tony was the Director of the Department of Maternal and Newborn Child and Adolescent Health at WHO Geneva. I will not go through uh, what his broad uh, uh, contribution to global health has been, but he's been the founder and, and the lead person looking at the whole issue of community um, and women's groups and uh, their impact on health in various parts of the world. So let me start by offering the floor to Dr. Marina. Uh, and uh, Marina, perhaps when you finish, Tony can just follow. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here. I'm going to try to share my screen. If you can just let me know when you see it. There you are. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to present to you a bit of the research and the work we, we've been doing this year at the Lancet Countdown and our key findings. And then I know Anthony will tell a bit about how we can respond to this. Um, just to give you a very quick overview, the Lancet Countdown is in its very essence a research collaboration that nucleates uh, 43 leading academic institutions and UN agencies around the world and over 120 researchers from a range of fields. And we come together once a year to produce these reports that get published in the Lancet. Our reports have indicators. This year we have 44 indicators tracking progress on health and climate change tracking how climate change is up to date, impacting on the health of people around the world and how the way we're responding to climate change can help improve uh, the health of, of people as well. The report that you see here in big uh, is obviously our latest report. And um, the title of this report is Code Red for a Healthy Future. And I'm gonna tell you a bit why that is. When we think about climate change, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously increasing temperatures. Heat waves are very dangerous, particularly to, to vulnerable groups, to people over 65 years of age, to very young children, or to those living with underlying health conditions like heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease. And they are so because apart from being extremely uncomfortable, they can tip people over the edge, exacerbate these conditions, and they can be lethal. So what we're tracking in this indicator is the extent to which these vulnerable groups, people over 65 years of age and people under one year old, are increasingly being exposed to, um, to heat waves around the world. And as you can see here, exposure to heat wave has been increasing very rapidly over the past years, particularly since the 2010s. In 2020, if we compare it to just a baseline that finished in 2005, just about 16 years ago, We've seen 3 billion more percent days of heat wave exposure in people over 65 years of age and over 6 million more in very young children, putting their health at extreme risk. We've seen heat waves in uh, the Northwest USA, Canada, reaching over uh, almost 50 degrees this year, the same in Sicily, in, in Italy, uh, in Kazakhstan, also in, in the last June. 
So this is becoming a really acute problem, but it's not only a problem for because of its uh, impact on mortality or morbidity. It's also a problem in terms of our livelihoods. We know that there's physiological limits to the work that we can do under um, extreme temperatures. Obviously, people working outdoors are the most vulnerable to these very high temperatures. So what we also track here is the change in labor capacity of very vulnerable groups, the, the, the reduction of hours in which they can work outdoors. And as you can see in these maps um, that we have here on the right, we've stratified the groups according to human development index. And what you can see is that the countries with low a medium level of human development index are seeing incredibly high amounts of hours being lost, particularly in the agricultural sector that is being the most impacted. Here you have the case of um, Pakistan. In Pakistan, we saw almost 18, or at least over 18 um, potential billion hours of labor being lost. And again, most of this happened in the agricultural sector, those vulnerable workers that are um, highly exposed. What is also interesting is that when we look at what this means in terms of income, the losses that the countries in the low human development index saw in terms of income loss associated with loss of labor capacity amounted to 4% roughly of its total GDP. So it's also undermining um, livelihoods and as a consequence, the social determinants of health due to the increasing temperatures. And another area that is of huge concern is the reduction in um, our crop productivity and the risk to our food security. With increasing temperatures, crops don't um, reach their normal maturity uh, cycle, so much they mature too quickly and they yield smaller seeds, therefore crop yield potential gets reduced. And this is what you're seeing in screen. We're tracking the reduction in crop yield potential as a consequence of the increasing temperatures. The graphs that you see here on the left show you global trends. We're seeing reductions of 3% of crop yield potential for winter wheat, uh, over 5 for soybean, almost 2% for rice, relatively to, uh, relative to a baseline that finished only in 2010. And as you can see here, the reduction is being quite steep over the past few years. And I'm showing you here on the right that this is the case also for Pakistan, where particularly in May, we saw uh, a very steep reduction of almost 4%. Uh, since this baseline of 1981 to 2010. And in the same way, we're seeing many of our indicators, most of our indicators um, flashing red, showing increasingly um, severe impacts of climate change on our health. We're seeing heat-related mortality increasing in most countries around the world. We're seeing the lethality of extreme events also going up. Marine food security putting put increasingly as, at risk, apart from the terrestrial food security that I spoke about already. Wildfires increasingly impacting different countries and exposure to uh, wildfires going up. And something that we've heard about already um, is the increased uh, climatic suitability for infectious disease transmission. And we're seeing particularly um, the, the disease that we're tracking are dengue, vibrio, cholera, other vibrio diseases, and malaria. And in all of these diseases, we're seeing that around the world, the environmental conditions are becoming more and more suita suitable for their transmission undermining control measures uh, for these diseases. So this is why we say that this indicator gives a code red for a healthy future. However, perhaps the most concerning thing is that we are, despite these accelerated impacts of climate change on health, not responding nearly as fast as we should. The energy system is one of the main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions and therefore to the climate crisis. We have the tools and we have the technologies to decarbonize our energy system. However, if you look at this graph here, which is, I know, quite busy, but if you look at the uh, black line, what this black line is showing you is the carbon intensity of the global energy system since the 1970s to, the, to 2018, that was our last year of data. And as you can see, the carbon intensity of the global energy system has remained fairly static over the past years. It just has decreased only a slight bit. And at the rate of reduction that we've seen since 2014, it would take us 150 years to fully decarbonize our global energy system, which as you can probably guess, is absolutely incompatible with Paris Agreement goals. If we look at what this means in terms of countries with different levels of human development index, it is the countries with the most resources, the ones with the highest level of human development index that are by and large decarbonizing their energy system because they have the technology they can afford it. The rest of the countries, including Pakistan, are increasing the carbon intensity of their energy system. So we have a big inequity here in the way countries are being able to respond. And this translates directly 
into the inequalities in the co-benefits of that, that decarbonization. When we talk about energy systems and health, mainly because decarbonizing our energy system would also bring huge benefits in terms of quality of air. Around the world, we're seeing 3.3 million deaths that are attributable, attributable to PM2.5, the most harmful uh, form of air pollution. And a third of these are directly related to the burning of fossil fuels. If you look at this graph, again, we're seeing that countries with medium and high uh, human development index levels, those that have the highest carbon intensity of their energy systems, are the ones that have the highest deaths attributable to PM2.5. The low human development index group will have the highest death attributable to indoor air pollution because they're still using dirty uh, sources of fuel for, um, for in the domestic sector, biomass particularly. So also big inequities in the way countries are being able to enjoy the co-benefits of that rapid decarbonization. In Pakistan, in 2019, we estimate that there were 90, over 94,000 deaths attributable to PM2.5 and over 3,600 came directly from the burning of coal, something that we can already face out and we have cleaner technologies to do. It's just that we need to be able to, to, to do that transition and enjoy the health co-benefits that that brings. And perhaps one of the most concerning things is that de despite the, the very well um, acknowledged impacts of climate change on health and the benefits of decarbonization, countries are still by and large subsidizing fossil fuel burning. We've studied 84 countries, and of these 84 countries that are the main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, 77% still subsidize fossil fuel burnings. If we take into account all of the subsidies and all of the taxes that they have, they were still overall designating public funds to fossil fuel subsidies. What you can see in this graph is what the total funds that countries allocate to fossil fuel burnings represent in terms of the percentage of their health budget. And many countries designate big percentages of their health budget to subsidizing fossil fuels. In Pakistan, the, the total fossil fuel subsidies amount to um, about 55% of what their total health budget is. So there's a huge opportunity to reallocating those funds to activities that benefit health, build and harm it. However, we're still seeing some hope. Um, when we look at decarbonization of the energy system, Again, that area that contributes the most to greenhouse gas emissions, there is progress being done. And we've reached a peak in 2018 of 7.2% of global electricity being produced from renewable sources. With China and the US, and Germany, Germany, India, the biggest emitters uh, accelerating that transition. So if this pace continues, which would be a challenge, then we would be on a good route to decarbonize uh, the energy system at least. And we do have the technology to do so. With that, I will just close with some of our key takeaway messages from the report. As the world is trying to exit the COVID pandemic, we are allocating enormous amounts of funds, trillions of dollars in terms of COVID recovery. And so far, what we're seeing is that those COVID recovery plans would undermine Paris Agreement goals because they are financing carbon intensive activities. However, because we're unrolling all of these funds, all of a sudden we have the opportunity of uh, uh, kind of quite immediately transitioning our economies. And what that allows us is to have this opportunity to finally deliver a better future if we allocate these COVID recovery plans to activities that um, deliver economic and environmental sustainability, better health and reduced inequities. We could finally make that transition. However, of course, as we've seen in COP26, for this, we do need leaders to commit to urgent action and to ensure that there's an, a just response such that no one is left behind. And with that, I will just pass on to um, Anthony that will talk a bit about how we can address this challenge. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marina. And that's, you've given the website on which this report is hosted. There's a question from the audience. So Tony, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. And a huge thank you to Marina for all the amazing work she's done in getting this report together. Somebody's asked, uh, how they can get the report. It's freely downloadable from The Lancet. I think Marina will put the link in the chat, but do, do look at it and also visit the website because there's a lot of data there that you can access readily. Um, I'm just going to, hang on. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay, so uh, interesting title to this, The New Norms of Global Health. And I'm gonna talk about children in all policies by 2030. And um, 
this is what the problem is, basically, that the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide is steadily rising. And we know that despite all the conferences, protocols, accords and agreements that and Glasgow, we, you know, we haven't arrested that in virtually any way so far. And if you look here at um, the the offenders, if you like, US at the top, UK seems to be coming down, although that is our production emissions. It doesn't take account of our consumption emissions, which may be attributed to China or wherever we import from. But India, light blue, and then Pakistan at the bottom, although you're a big country and you do contribute, your per head uh, emissions are very low. So you're a victim rather than a perpetrator. Um, I... I found this in a fabulous report that came out earlier this year. I love coming to Pakistan. I think it's one of the most beautiful, diverse countries I've ever been in, apart from the food and the company. But you're well aware, as as Madam Naveed has explained, about the risks and existence already of extreme heat waves, heavy rainfall and floods, drought in Sindh, and the, the potential for sea level rise in future. So I won't go over that anymore. Um, if we look at the world nutrition situation, the number of undernourished people has remained pretty static for the past 15 years or so, but had a sharp increase last year, which in large part is put down to the pandemic and the ep- uh, economic effects of that. But as Marina has pointed out, the, the longer term impacts of climate are quite considerable. And um, in addition to that, We know know already there's a very complex background to all of this because we're not on track to reach SDG 6 of safe drinking water. In many ways, the climate crisis is a water crisis, as we know about drought and floods and water management and rainfall variability. Sorry. And the whole issue of the pandemic requires water if we're going to have a successful uh, a way to, you know, have infection control, which is, and we are not out of this pandemic yet, as we well know, in as the threat of Omicron comes. Now, in on top of that, there are many other trends going on. We all know the importance of breastfeeding. We also know that uh, breastfeeding rates are at their lowest rate ever in the world. And indeed, actually, in Pakistan, I was rather surprised to find that your exclusive breastfeeding rate at 38% and six months is pretty similar to the UK. So all over the world, this is affecting us. Uh, We know that many thousands of deaths could be prevented by more exclusive breastfeeding. It has cognitive effects, effects on obesity, diabetes, and of course, the whole mobilization of our world economy is geared to promoting junk food, sugary drinks, and that's why we have an obesity pandemic. And another fact is, more than 90% of the world's children breathe toxic air every day. I mean, these are staggering figures. And it sets the scene for how are we going to cope politically to deal with these enormous problems and give our children a better future. So that was a question we asked when I, just before I left uh, WHO, we asked that question um, with a a high level commission led by Helen Clark, the Prime Minister of New Zealand or former Prime Minister, Awa Kol Sek, who some of you will know, Minister of State from Senegal. And, And it took us two or three years. We had 41 commissioners, including Professor Buta and many others, And we talked a lot about what we could do. And it's clear that children need protection from every sector. Every ministry is a health ministry. So in transport, I I looked up in 2018, 36,000 people were killed in Pakistan on the roads. And a lot of those were young people and six times as many boys as girls. We know that agriculture and trade, we talked about food subsidies, trade rules, food policies, Children don't have places to play in many developing urban centers. We know all about the the huge impact of air pollution and what can we do about it because it's got worse in so many places. We know about family services for children in very stressful environments where domestic violence is common. Housing, 40% of children live in informal settlements around the world. Education is of vital importance. And we know that progress on the child related SDGs is stalled. Uh, More than 2 billion people, that's, you know, uh, 
what is that, a quarter of the world's population at least live in countries affected by fragility and conflict. Many countries are not reporting their data. In fact, very few are, in fact, when you look at it. And, and so after our report came out, and I'll talk about its five main findings briefly, we, we felt that we should try and set up or catalyze a movement, which we've called Children in All Policies, CAP 2030, to think about ways in which cross-sectoral activity can you know, work together. So the, the first message was that women and children must be placed at the center of the SDGs and the climate response. Every generation has a duty to leave the world better for its children than, than they found it. And that's not going to be the case with my generation. I think my generation has failed. And the cost of inaction and the financing gap has to be addressed. And we need to get this into cabinets, not just into ministries of health. We need at cabinet level people to recognize that investing in children is the best thing you can do. And, and you can back that up with Nobel Prize winner James Heckman, who won a Nobel Prize for showing what we all know as pediatricians, that if you invest in women in uh, preconceptual care, pregnancy and early infancy and the like, you're going to get a tremendous return on investment if you want to do it in dollar terms and a much healthier, happier society and one that's more productive. The second, which sounds really boring, is unified multi-sectoral action. So we need ministries to collaborate, but it, maybe that's the wrong target. I always think ministries collaborating is always difficult. You need the cabinet to think that's where they're all meeting together and down at district level where um, the various dis, you know, faculties or sectors come together more readily. And of course, down at community level. So we need to think about ways in which all those levels are thinking in a more multi-sectoral way. And just to give you an example, so earlier this year, and this has only been going for about nine months, we invited nine of the countries that we have worked with on the commission and others we knew to come up with their own suggestions. What would you like to do to work uh, across the health and other sectors? So in Argentina, Raul Mercer, a pediatrician, has set up a network on children's rights across Latin America. In Ghana, they're looking at early childhood development. And they had a very clever idea in Ghana. They set up a national conference where, you know, pediatricians, ministers and many NGOs came together with lots of child participation to talk about the needs of the futures of children. And they came up with children's prize winning designs for policies that would increase green spaces and play areas and the like. So we do need to listen to children and young people. Um, in South Africa, they're looking at alcohol consumption because uh, in during the pandemic, they had prohibition in order to free up hospital beds and uh, so for COVID. And they're looking at the impacts because it seems that if you have much stricter alcohol rules, you have much bigger impacts on child health, less stress and the like. In Nepal, they're looking at how to build resilience uh, and this is in the early stages of using adolescents with mobile phones, citizen science. So adolescents feel young people involved in collecting information about their environment and then having group meetings with local leaders to think about ways to tackle it. So in Nepal, it's landslides. In the Pacific Islands, the indigenous peoples are facing a horrific challenge with flooding and sea encroachment. Uh, in India, we're working very preliminary work on urban planning for children to make low cost housing more child friendly. Uh, and indeed in France and Senegal, looking at mental health, social protection, the kind of things that, you know, pediatricians have been doing for a very long time. It's interesting with the French group, um, we've set up a, a youth council that's going to meet regularly from all over the world to discuss some of these issues. But I think actually this needs to be replicated at country and even regional levels in countries so that you're getting true voices about people thinking about their locality, because that's what moves people most. The grand concept of climate change is very difficult. So how do we act on climate? There's no sense working towards children's health today if they don't have a future. That's a picture I took in Glasgow at the COP actually in a 
a protest. I'm very worried. So what can we do? We know that our house is on fire. We know that there are many actors around the world like Greta Thunberg. Uh, that's a picture from Australia, actually, with people fleeing from wildfires into the sea. This is every country is affected. No region is is spared from the effects of climate change. And just to leave you with a few thoughts about what can we all do? I mean, that's clearly it involves government, it involves corporates, it involves individuals. And this is not a cost. This is an investment. We could save tens you know, of trillions of dollars by moving towards a green economy with huge health benefits. So very quickly, and I'm not going to go over this more than to mention them. You know, we've got in all countries, actually, but much more in the wealthy countries of, of, of the world, renewable energy, cut subsidies, active and public transport everywhere, carbon neutral buildings, reforesting. My country is the most deforested country virtually ever, and we need to reforest Britain, um, recycle. Sustainable agriculture is incredibly important and encouraging people to move towards more uh, green and plant-based diets. Doesn't mean you can't eat meat. And of course, in Pakistan, you eat a lot of lamb, which is not so bad as a ruminant as, as some of the others. Green business and infrastructure. Uh, Organisations the same. If you're in a hospital or a university or uh, any kind of building, what are your reduction targets? Uh, what about renewable energy? Are you involving your workers in sustainability, buildings, reforesting, lobbying government and coming up with innovative ideas? And likewise for individuals, we've got to talk about it and very much put it in the locality because people are anxious and scared because they feel powerless. And I won't go over all of those issues as well. I mean, in the West, we need to divest our pension funds from fossil fuels, and we've got to move there very fast. Finally, we, we ranked countries in our report, not just according to the usual measures of child flourishing, but in a sense also which countries will exceed their emissions targets who are damaging in future. And of course, that reverses the table so that you may have Norway and Japan at the top of the child flourishing and Chad at the bottom, but it reverses itself when you look at those countries that are emitting the most uh, and damaging the future lives of children. And finally, we worked a little bit this year with WHO and UNICEF on much simpler ways of presenting what's happening to children, to policymakers with dashboards. During COVID, a, a senior guy in the British government told me, we didn't look at any academic papers during the pandemic. We were too busy. We just needed a dashboard to let us know what to do. And he said, actually, I followed a teenager on Twitter that gave me a dashboard. So I think we need to think much more realistically about what information policymakers can observe. And this is something we hope to launch in the new year, um, or rather WHO and UNICEF will, uh, and a way of telling a country how it's doing, where it might focus on, and then follow up to see what they're actually doing. The last thing is protection from commercial marketing. This is a very big issue. We've just had a meeting about that uh, with some experts from around the world. I'm not going to go into it, although we could talk about it later, but it is extremely important because children are being targeted like never before with surveillance capitalism in my country, gambling. I know you've got very strict rules on gambling in Pakistan, but in my country, it's ubiquitous, every sports event. And look at the rise in problem gamblers that we're seeing in young people. And of course, the whole new wave of social media, the metaverse, neuromarketing and the like, is really threatening our children in all kinds of ways. And it's a wild west out there. We need to get this under control. So I'll stop there, Zulfi, and let us move on. But thank you. It's been a great pleasure. I wish I could be with you. Thank you so much, Tony, for uh, that stellar presentation. You and Marina have really set the scene from a global <clears throat> perspective of how this can be tracked. And, uh, and I'm sure there'll be tons of questions in the, from, the, from the audience. So we'd like to move on to our next presenter, who is uh, Dr. Azia Safdar. She is currently a senior advisor at the Sustainable Development Policy Institute and a former Deputy Director of General Health and Director of Institutions at the Ministry of National Health Services, Regulation and Coordination, Government of Pakistan. 
She is an expert in public health, health systems, and the environment. And today she's going to talk to us about the health system vulnerability, resilience, and climate change issues. Um, Dr. Rezia, the floor is yours, please. And you're muted. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bhutta, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Actually, I'm trying to share my screen. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, let me just... Uh... Should be that green screen, yeah. Okay, yeah. Is it a slideshow? If you go to the top, it will allow you to put it in slideshow. Yeah. Uh, Linda? Yes, sorry. Yeah, this, yeah, this is slideshow. Just do it from beginning. Click here. Click, click here, please. Okay. Okay. Sorry for uh, delay. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, I think uh, uh, this is uh, to talk about a very important uh, uh, link, missing link in uh, climate action. And this is recognized this year at COP26. At uh, COP26, because um, explicitly, and uh, health program is included in that. And uh, also, the uh, there was a WHO event on uh, health, and they talked about the climate um, uh, health system and healthcare facilities resist resistance to the climate uh, change. And uh, what are we going to uh, do about that? So it is from the health perspective. And um, uh, we all know that uh, what are the impacts of the uh, climate change on human health. And uh, there are four main areas where which are if in impacting on the health of the people. That is the rising temperature as discussed uh, earlier. And uh, then is uh, rising sea levels mod, uh, and uh, more extreme weather events like floods, storms, and uh, uh, other events. And uh, then uh, there are uh, increase in the carbon dioxide level. Obviously, that is the reason for a uh, uh, lot of uh, for the climate change, main climate change. And um, can we? Uh, and uh, we uh, we need to uh, understand that what are the climate change risks, climate change hazards, climate uh, vulnerability impact, and then is the uh, climate exposure. So the climate change impacts on the human health are uh, the basically the interplay of all these uh, um, uh, components. And uh, these are the exposure to the hazard. And then uh, what are the vulnerabilities or the what are the resilience of the uh, human beings or the systems which uh, will uh, protect us from the uh, climate? If we, if we do, don't have any management or if we don't have the systems in place, so that will uh, result in the risk, uh, will result in a bigger impact. But if there are certain uh, mitigational or adaptive uh, measures taken, that will result in the reduced uh, risk uh, uh, risk uh, magnitude. So, uh, so I I think the our healthcare system is uh, or healthcare facilities, uh, especially the health, uh, they need to be become uh, environmentally sustainable and the climate resilient. So uh, that is not only the uh, there are four uh, main components of the healthcare. Um, uh, facilities or the healthcare system, which are uh, more vulnerable, that is the human resource, uh, or they are backbones also for the uh, running of the healthcare uh, system. Uh, they are the human resource, they are the uh, water, uh, water sanitation and uh, wash sector, then is the infrastructure and the products and the uh, med including medicines. And the fourth one is the energy sector, which is very important. But the other health system, other uh, 
components of the health systems, which are the leadership governance uh, and uh, the my, uh, health information system, they are also important in the in uh, running of the health system, as we have seen in the. So, according to the. Uh, policy uh, uh, recommendations are that under the healthcare settings, the goal is that all the healthcare facilities and the services are environmentally sustainable, using safely managed water and sanitation services and the clean energy sustainably managing their waste and procuring the goods in a sustainable manner and are resilient to the extreme weather events and capable of protecting the health safety and the security of the health workforce. So this this is the like the this is a WHO guidelines or the tool for uh, 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 assessment of their vulnerabilities of the healthcare facilities, which are uh, which is and then making them the interven uh, doing the some interventions which uh, will make the healthcare facilities uh, uh, which will improve the resilience of the healthcare facilities during uh, against the climate change. And uh, so these vulnerabilities can be uh, like uh, the, they have divided into the hazards and the impacts that the hazards are like uh, the storm, flood and drought and uh, heat waves. And uh, then um, uh, the like, uh, but for the Pakistan, that is the main thing is that to establish the baseline where we are standing at the moment. And um, this is the interplay of all the risk factors and uh, the healthcare uh, hazards and the exposure and uh, the so so this is the this slide is showing that um, uh, how the these interplay of different exposure vulnerability and climate hazards are uh, making the uh, are impacting on the health systems. So this graph is like uh, for example the we have seen during the COVID-19 also, like uh, if their health systems are not uh, prepared or uh, there are no uh, adaptations or the preventive uh, strategies, then the, the, the health system response will, um, uh, uh, will uh, uh, if there is a climate change uh, a shock, uh, shock event, and then the response is, uh, can result in either a recovery uh, to the uh, pre-event state, or it can uh, it transform, or it can even be better because there are a lot of like uh, in COVID-19, lot of resources and lot of uh, action is being taken by the at the government level, at the national level, provincial level, government level, and individual level. So Pakistan's healthcare system is um, like um, uh, is uh, it both public and private sector and uh, we start from the community level and uh, where the our LHW and outreach workers are uh, active and to the tertiary level hospital we saw we have five tiers uh, five level interventions uh, uh, healthcare system interventions where we can improve the health of the and uh, at the moment we have uh, in the public sector we have uh, 1279 more than 1000 uh, hospitals tertiary uh, uh, both tertiary and secondary and and the primary healthcare system is also in place. At the moment, we have 6.33 per uh, 10,000 population, one bed, and uh, which is uh, not um, enough because uh, according to the standards, it's 18 uh, beds per 10,000 population is required to give a good uh, response uh, to the any shock. Uh, like uh, during the COVID-19, we saw this um, uh, happening and uh, we have uh, during the COVID-19 in response, we uh, added 7000 beds are added in the system and uh, which are oxygen um, uh, equipped with the oxygen and uh, they are uh, with the help of at the provincial level at the national level also. So health workforce, which is very, very important in this uh, regard. And uh, we have the density of uh, 1.45 per uh, thousand uh, population. We have uh, 1.45 uh, 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 health workforce, which is uh, much, much less. And uh, that is uh, required is 4.45 according to the international standards. So uh, we did, uh, then we come to the WASH sector and we did, um, uh, when I was at Ministry of Health, we did a national scoping study on WASH in healthcare facilities. That was the first uh, 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 at, at a national level and uh, which we came up with the um, with certain uh, results and uh, though 88% of the healthcare facilities have the water available within the facility level 
but the water quality is uh, uh, monitored only in 16 percent which is also important for the ipc and other uh, impacts uh, other uh, disease uh, uh, prevention and uh, we have the 100 percent of the facilities has the toilet available but on 24 percent of the toilet units were non-functional and 33 uh, percent of the healthcare facilities has uh, sex segregation only 18 percent have the toilets dedicated to the people with limited uh, functional uh, mobility or physical disabilities so uh, also the hand hygiene uh, stations were in 61% uh, facilities but there we were also lacking in uh, uh, lacking the material uh, hand washing materials and environmental cleaning was not very um, bad and not very good actually what what is required and with the actually the function of the wash is mainly the ipc so the only the 44 uh, facility observed the cleaning on the schedule and regular inspe uh, inspections uh, done by the sanitary inspectors so the um, uh, healthcare waste management was very uh, not very up to the mark and uh, we were doing we are doing only the basic that is in the uh, as we can see in this uh, pyramid uh, this these are disposed treat uh, uh, recover is recycle the five hour um, four hours uh, uh, things but uh, we are uh, doing very both basic disposal only 47 percent uh, uh, are burnt uh, waste is burnt or uh, bur buried in the pits and only 13% is incinerated or uh, disposed of with the mi microwave or climate uh, or incinerators. In the energy sector, we have minimum st uh, standards, but um, innovations like uh, green energy is required in the healthcare facilities and the solar energy alternatives are required. And in some certain health facilities, it has already been started and uh, there are our energy shortage and break uh, results in the losses and that contributes to the uh, uh, loss of human life as well as the loss of um, uh, uh, the, like for example the refrigeration is uh, uh, shut down during these energy shortages or energy breakouts so that can result in the loss of medicines loss vaccines and uh, that is a big loss and uh, economic it, it we it we convert it into the economic loss that is a bigger economic loss and and uh, in, there was a study in uh, 50, 78 LMICs and only 59% of the LMICs uh, have the reliable energy sources. And uh, then uh, uh, that is the infrastructure procedure, uh, procurement and equipment. So that is this uh, uh, infrastructure and procurements uh, and uh, the processes, they all uh, uh, are also part of the contribution to the uh, greenhouse gases emission and uh, results in the climate change. And also they are affected by the extreme events or the climate uh, uh, change and we but we don't have any uh, national level assessments on that so what we need and uh, so but uh, this uh, infrastructure procurements and uh, this this also has to be contextualized because you know that uh, if we talk about the climate change, the events happening at uh, 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 like in uh, North area is different as compared to the events happening in the uh, south of uh, Pakistan, like, for example, the floods and uh, 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 floods and uh, heat waves. So we have to uh, go for the green, um, uh, clean, green uh, healthcare facilities in some areas of Pakistan. This is already being started, and uh, the, there is a concept of uh, smart healthcare facilities. If we look at the SDGs, uh, these are related to the uh, these healthcare facilities resilience and uh, the healthcare uh, the uh, main components of the healthcare facilities to deliver the service uh, for service delivery. These are uh, 12, uh, 7, uh, 6, 8.8. .8. And uh, yeah, this uh, this picture is taken from a um, uh, report, recent report in 2020, which was um, highlighted about that uh, the many of the SDGs which are uh, uh, the targets are still not set on that, and these are all related to the health, but in other sectors. So multi-sectoral approach is uh, required for that. And uh, at the work done at the national level, at the Ministry of National Health Services, uh, like uh, in uh, 2020, we could uh, uh, gather our data and uh, we could uh, produce, uh, there is a country profile which has talked about the heat waves and uh, uh, all the climate change. And there are some uh, certain projections. We could do the um, 
health co-benefit study and uh, the uh, there was a uh, one recommended uh, madam uh, ruksana has uh, ruksana nwid has uh, highlighted about that also so the um, uh, there was a one of the recommendation was utilization of economic benefits towards the health sector and uh, there was multi sectoral intervention uh, is uh, inclusion inclusive of climate change is in uh, process and uh, uh, climate change is the main uh, area where uh, we are going to uh, do and it is difficult job because it has to be many of the ministries and the many of the sectors to be involved in that and the health is included in the ndcs this time and uh, there is a high level uh, commitment to the uh, to do the vulnerability and adaptation assessment and uh, climate resilient healthcare systems in pakistan our minister of um, health uh, sapm health uh, dr faisal sultan has uh, committed in the cop 26 to do that and uh, then uh, but our limitations are like uh, we don't have any vulnerability assessments and uh, our number capacity and occupational safety of healthcare workers or human resource for health towards climate change is still not explored and uh, the uh, so that need to be looked into and uh, governance interdependent uh, interdepartmental interministerial coordination mechanisms are uh, there are still uh, some mechanisms, but still they are not robust to uh, look after the climate change and health relationship. And uh, the, there is a post devolution, the provincial coordinations are sometimes it, uh, it is difficult. And uh, interministerial forum is for the health ministry, interministerial forum, forum exists, but still uh, the climate action or the climate change uh, and the health uh, sector is not uh, uh, very uh, to the top. And uh, this was the uh, like a, a, a framework for a study which was uh, planned in 2020, but uh, due to the uh, uh, COVID-19 situation, uh, so this could not be uh, launched. So, so that is according to the uh, like WHO recommendation for doing the vulnerability and adaptation assessments. And then that is the iterative uh, uh, procedures, the process that is means that uh, we do the vulnerability assessment and then we do the intervention, then again, monitor them and then see the uh, effects. So these are different phases of uh, this uh, study and hopefully, hopefully we can uh, uh, start with it. So the health argument uh, is uh, like uh, the in uh, COP26, the WHO has released and um, uh, 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 published a um, uh, health argument for climate action. So that is also very important. And in, in, in the, and they have talked about uh, the COVID recovery and uh, climate action, which is in the center and which is very important. And uh, health system resilience to the climate risks is the main uh, focus on that. And the clean and sustainable energy hardness and the health benefits to of the climate action. So whatever the climate action health benefits is, we can uh, 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 depend on that. And then uh, there are uh, in all policies, you have to have the health centered climate action. And uh, then is the listen to the health community and prescribe the urgent action, uh, uh, climate action. And uh, it's very important to um, uh, include the climate health action and uh, in all the policy uh, policies in the in and it should be inclusive uh, approach and the special focus is on the awareness capacity building and the focus on the occupational safety of the healthcare workers who are the frontline workers and who are uh, uh, on the climate risks and vulnerabilities along with the social protection is required as we saw in the uh, covid-19 thank you very much thank you Travis. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azia. And uh, in the interest of time, we will proceed. And I'm now very pleased to invite uh, Professor Zafar Fatni uh, to speak on uh, climate change and emerging infectious diseases. Uh, professor Fatni is the professor in section lead in environmental, occupational health and injuries in the Department of Community Health Sciences, the Aga Khan University. Uh, he has had many leadership positions, including uh, uh, being the chair of the Community Medicine Residency Program, uh, and uh, being a supervisor at the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons. He has a stellar publication record in issues related to environmental, occupational hazards and injuries. So Zafar, uh, the floor is yours, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I hope you can hear me. 
Yes, we can. Thank yeah, you. thank you. So good afternoon um, from Karachi, Pakistan, where I'm sitting. Um, and thank you for you know inviting me for this session on climate change and infectious diseases. As Anthony said, you know, water issues, vector bond issues, and you know, uh, those um, uh, those issues are central to climate change. Uh, so is the infectious diseases because they are linked with that. Um, However, what I reviewed and I found, uh, you know, very little uh, information, empirical evidence available in infectious disease and climate change. However, uh, there's tons of uh, information which is available on environmental uh, risk factors and infectious diseases, which actually uh, gives us the base uh, because climate change or climate drivers actually work through these uh, environmental drivers so all the existing pathways of environmental factors and infectious diseases are actually speeded up and, and that's what we are seeing. Uh, so, and, and newer pathways are developing. Uh, so that's, uh, we have to see. So in this brief talk, I'll, I'll review the available evidence and touch upon potential threats of infectious disease, outbreaks and uh, pandemics we expect to face. And finally also, what measures can we take uh, now to develop some resilience against that and in low and middle income countries? We in the big picture, particularly, uh, we talk about, you know, uh, this big picture, we forget about social economic status, we forget about individual and families impact and their contribution to and their resilience uh, towards climate change. So, so that uh, I'll, I'll just touch upon on, uh, briefly as well. So just a reminder, uh, the climate change is real. Um, the Arctic ice is visibly depleted over time. Um, and this is, uh, again, uh, you know, when I was looking at as what, uh, you know, evidence are available. So we know from our fundamental knowledge of epidemiology that the environmental factors are closely linked with infectious diseases and climate change is an environmental influence. Uh, so, and climate, uh, you know, change is, is a, we have to understand is a meta health problem. So it is pushing issues with underlying numerous other problem. And generally it is pushing the normal pathways of disease development. However, also creating newer and more complex relationship between environmental factors and disease development. This is what is uh, happening in infectious disease as well. So what pathways uh, uh, we have, common pathways through which communicable diseases occur, uh, which are pushed by climate change. Known pathways are air quality deteriorating, water quality and quantity getting affected, food supply and nutrition value of the food gets affected. Extreme weather events lead to vector bond disease, uh, increasing their geography and intensity. And also not uh, the last one, but socioeconomic uh, factors, including displacement due to extreme weather events, causes humanitarian crisis and whatnot. So has received uh, a push uh, because of the climate change. And all these drivers are actually leading to increase in the infectious diseases. So what uh, diseases are more sensitive to, uh, so we know vector-borne diseases, we know water-borne diseases, we know food-borne diseases, all these diseases are more sensitive to climate drivers and the, the less sensitive are the STDs uh, or the tuberculosis we know. Uh, so when I started in public health, and it reminds me early in my career that there was a brief belief that, you know, world would be free of communicable diseases soon. And, uh, you know, it is declining. And, and also, however, the pandemic like COVID, emergence, emerging diseases telling some of the story. And climate change is now um, is a big threat to increase the incidence and prevalence of communicable diseases. Uh, so I looked at the evidence, so the evidence regarding, uh, you know, uh, publication of climate change infectious disease are increasing over time. Uh, we have some evidence on dengue, malaria, cholera, and leptospirosis, uh, and mostly from the Western uh, countries, and not many from the developing or low middle income countries. Uh, what it causes, actually, as you know, that uh, 
you know, environmental burden of disease globally is more severe and stronger, and the burden of disease is much higher for the developing country, particularly the countries of Africa and Asian countries. Uh, and that's where uh, we, we don't have a lot of, uh, you know, information on that. Just one um, information, um, you know, it, it's about dengue. Uh, uh, mosquito was modeled uh, for the, and it is projected for 2050. The geography increasing. However, the presence of both the species of Aedes albopictus and also the Aedes aegypti uh, is increasing at one place. And that would uh, make it a more complex and, you know, how it would lead to uh, or pronounce the, uh, the impact of dengue. Those are the uncertain areas of, of uh, climate change. Uh, some um, information I, I borrowed from uh, this report uh, from Health and Climate Change Country Profile, which was recently launched by WHO. And it says there's rising temperature and you might have a scenario where 5.1 degrees centigrade um, uh, you know, uh, rise by Tucker, but also, uh, you know, uh, at least if they're saying at least 1.4 degrees centigrade would be, uh, you know, uh, the minimum scenario we will have. Uh, and that, even if that happens, uh, and if there is a 10% increase in the precipitation, we would expect a huge problem. We already are suffering with the only 0.5 degrees centigrade rise since last 50 years and having its impact. So what diseases, uh, so the sensitive, uh, climate sensitive health risks was listed. I'm, I may not agree with all what is listed here, uh, but it says that health impact of extreme uh, weather events, waterborne diseases, uh, zoonosis is not listed I, I, uh, you know, in this, vector-borne diseases and food-borne diseases. So some of these uh, these lists uh, have been created, obviously, if you look at the background of it, so the very little evidence uh, base is there. Um, again, uh, looking at climate-based infectious disease with early warning system potential, so what disease we need to put on surveillance. Uh, we have on the top of the list malaria, dengue, leishmania, meningococcal meningitis, but there are other diseases around the globe, particularly African countries, uh, where you have a longer list. But these are the diseases which we know from previous, but what has happened is actually it, its incidence and geography is changing, um, and that we need to measure. Uh, we don't have a measure at the moment. And, and see uh, what is the impact it will have um, and, and on the population in the future. So uh, coming to uh, what is steps are needed to tackling this issue, uh, you need to have climate resiliency, which Dr. Razia has also talked about, uh, assessment of vulnerabilities, uh, take evidence-based adaptation measures. We also need to prepare for disasters like COVID and certainly at all levels, there's a need to count carbon footprint. So this is where I, I want to stress a little more upon that. We have been counting carbon footprint at the national level, at the international level, at the country level. But what we are not doing is uh, translating that into individual level, families level, and institutional level. Because you, 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 what you expect and action at these level, you would otherwise we will be keep on counting at the national and international level the carbon footprint, but the action has to be taken at the individual families and social levels, uh, where uh, a lot of uh, you know improvement can be brought. But at the moment, there is no awareness and training about how to measure carbon footprint at the individual families and social levels and how uh, they can contribute to this uh, overall uh, you know, risk and uh, reduce that risk. Just coming to the close of my uh, presentation, uh, so adaptation obviously requires what it can offer. Uh, you know, if you have uh, like, uh, you can detect and treat disease, monitor, and then implement and monitor. But what you essentially need is monitoring and predicting epidemics. So that uh, capacity 
and data uh, and information is obviously, I mean, almost non-existent at the moment in low and middle income countries. They step two. You can do all the other things, but if you don't have that measure, uh, then certainly uh, it's it's difficult to achieve that. Lastly, uh, uh, I would leave with this uh, with this thought. You know, the the research challenge which is there. So there were like several factors have been implicated in um, you know infectious disease development from um, social factors to physical factors living conditions and all of that, but how the climate change is interacting with all these factors and what are the interaction effects of all these is not known. And that's where we are, you know, heading towards an unknown area of, uh, you know, burden of disease and certainly then there's uh, unknown interventions um, which we so, so this is the need of the R where we need to have more information on this uh, interaction with all the other factors, which is uh, based on data and availability of data, which is uh, which is required. So I'll just stop here and uh, hand it back over to Dr. Bhutta. Thank you. Thank you very much Safar, for the very interesting presentation. Our last speaker for this panel uh, is uh, Haris Majid. Haris is a global planetary health researcher uh, at the University of Toronto in Canada and is a PhD candidate at the Timothy School of uh, Faculty of Medicine. Uh, he has masters in uh, geophysics uh, and in medical sciences. Uh, he's been researching various aspects of climate change and its relationship with non-communicable and, and nutritional diseases. He's currently uh, with the Li Kai Shing Knowledge Research Institute and collaborates actively also with my group at the Center for Global Child Health. And Horace will speak today on the effects of climate change on stunting in, uh, and in children in particular, a case study from Pakistan. Thank you, Haris thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhutta and everyone. Thanks for having me. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, so here's my screen. I'm sure I hope everyone can see this. But today, as Dr. Bhutta mentioned, I'll be talking about a little bit specific topic, uh, focusing on uh, child stunting and wasting in Pakistan, and particularly the risk factor of climate change for a case study in Pakistan. So as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Bhutta mentioned, my name is Harris. That is. And so the, one of the brief things I would like to talk about is just a quick, quick background, a brief methodology that we conducted, uh, results and conclusions. And when I bring this topic, um, and it's a brief background, and really we understand that child malnutrition indicates stunting and wasting to be associated with micronutrient deficiencies. And we're talking about children under five years of age. And of course, child and wasting are both associated with increased mortality risk. Um, uh, along with micronutrition deficiencies. Uh, we know that globally, many reports, including the ones from Lancet, have shown that approximately 45% of children deaths in low and middle income countries uh, due to stunting. The idea here is that some risk factors of stunting and wasting include prenatal factors, genetics, inadequate diet, poor parental education, and response to episodes of disease being some of the factors, but yet, such factors are highly dependent on children's environment as indicated by my other fellow panelists. So of course, the environment and living conditions has a huge effect. And of course, we know that globally climate factors such as surface temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture, they are extremely important risk factors for health and nutritional outcomes, especially among children. There is hence a continued need to understand the magnitude and direction of the association between these climate variables and stunting and wasting in low and middle income countries. In 2019, interestingly, the United Nations declared the impacts of climate and health, uh, which were disproportionately burdened on low and middle income countries. And so the whole research question then with this study becomes that upon, upon controlling for coal barriers that are key, as I mentioned, some of them, what risks do climate variables pose on 
children's tenting and wasting in Pakistan subnationally. And really, the methodology here comes from a survey level analysis conducted from 2011 2018 for 105 districts in Pakistan, where the outcome is measured as stunting and wasting prevalence. The primary exposure being the annual mean surface temperatures, which is ideally measured at two meters above the surface. And of course, secondary being the precipitation, which precipitation, by the way, includes all form of water. So rain, snow, hail, if Pakistan has very minimal. So that's one of, the, one of the key secondary exposures. And of course, we also have surface moisture. Surface moisture being right above the surface. So approximately one to seven centimeters above, uh, of the surface. And that's, of course, 100% would mean fully saturated soil. Now this data is available from the European satellite for a approximate 30 degree, 30 kilometer resolution. Now for the methods in detail, of course, this was a ecological population-based study where we looked at the association between setting wasting prevalence with outcomes of climate variables, as I mentioned, and the outcome variables were normally distributed. If you look at my bottom left screen, of course, uh, this allowed the use of Poisson regression with autocoded residuals, meaning that there was the trend from 2011 to 2018, which was significant at times, hence a autocorrelated residual Poisson regression model was used. And we have district level data for the, the five provinces. So Azad, Jammu, Kashmir, Balochistan, Khyber, Patuha, Punjab, and Sindh. And of course, all significance were reported for less than P, 0 0.05. When I get into the results now, on the left, you'll see as whole of Pakistan, if I look at the year 2011 and compare it with 2018 for stunting and wasting, we clearly see that uh, stunting in, in brown, as you see, there's a significant trend here um, based on the mean, significant differences in the mean. But when we look at the wasting, it hasn't changed much over these seven or eight period, seven or eight year period. If we look at this by district, what you'll see interestingly is um, here in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, again, we see change diff significant changes in mean differences as well as Punjab. But for wasting here in green below, there has been a slight increase in wasting of children uh, significantly in sin. And that's also very interesting. When we look at it geospatially, you'll notice that the percent change, so we're looking at change in percent of stunting from 2018 to 2011, so that's the approximate 80 year change. What you'll notice here in all the provinces of Pakistan, and there's approximately a relatively similar uh, change here, so we're, we're looking at a positive change in stunting. And if we look, compare this to the wasting, wasting also shows a relatively positive change in wasting, meaning you know at most you get up to 14 or 15 percent of an increase in wasting from the past eight years. Now, getting into the climatological variables, if we have a look at the three variables: the climatologically, temperature, precipitation, soil water, as mentioned. Um, here, what you'll notice on the left is nationally when we look at 2011 temperatures. The national average of temperatures was approximately 27 degrees Celsius, where precipitation in 2011 was relatively low, as the same with soil, soil um, water moisture. So approximately land in Pakistan is about 20% moist. So that's relatively dry. But when we compare it to 2018, you'll see the trends have, uh, have significantly precipitation has declined in in terms of the mean precipitation, as well as the soil water, meaning which Pakistan is getting drier. And of course, when you look at it by region, uh, at the very top here, you'll see temperature in blue. So temperatures have increased their mean temperatures from 2011 to 2018, strongest in Sindh. At the same time, if we look at the Sindh precipitation, it's extreme sort of, we're leading into extreme drought in Sindh. At the same time, soil moisture has been a huge issue in Balochistan and Sindh as well. 
If I compare this again geospatially on the left, you'll see temperature. Let's face it, Pakistan's warming. So every single region in Pakistan is relatively warming um, based on changes in the past eight, eight years. So there's, there's about a two, two degrees increase at most in some regions except in the very, very north region, there's still some sustainability. That's because of the colder ice glaciers, perhaps that could explain this. But if you look at annual precipitation at the very, the very interesting, again, as I mentioned, all of Pakistan is becoming very dry. So especially Sindh is a major warming and dryness and the lack of precipitation. So there's a significant rise in temperatures and drought conditions noted in Sindh. If I look at the last pair of parameter of the climate variable, soil water, again, we see the same issue here. So Sindh and Balochistan heavily losing their soil moisture. At the same time, uh, we notice this also in parts of Punjab as well. Now, what's interesting here is the yield. I also looked at agriculture yield where I take into account maize, rice, pot. And when we look at the yield percent change, we also see that I know some of you have in the panels have highlighted this, but again, the the yield in Punjab has really declined, as well as some areas in Balochistan. So food security becomes an issue as well. Uh, when I share now, when I look at the association between on the left, so this stunting as an outcome, and I associate it with temperature, precipitation and soil water, as well as controlling for all the other variables mentioned earlier, such as income, education, et cetera. One of the most interesting things that you'll find the significant association results in Punjab and Sindh. And what you'll notice is temperature in Sindh, especially as I know, as I, as I um, mentioned earlier, has approximately a 1.12 fold increase in a one degree rise in temperatures and increase the risk 1.12 in stunting and sin. And that's that's really interesting when we look at waste as well. Wasting has an inverse effect of uh, a one degree increase in temperature, reducing the risk of wasting by 0 0.9. So the idea here is if I was to conclude this in one slide, that annual increase in one degree temperature in sin was approximately associated with the 1.12 times the risk of child stunting whereas the opposite effect was found for wasting. This is consistent for other studies seen in Africa and other parts of low-income countries. So temperature change was not associated with wasting any part of, in any province of Pakistan. Again, that's consistent as well. We also note that these results are and studies are and interesting because they result in both strong positive and strong negative association, which the link seems to be still yet the mediating factor unknown but there are definitely uh, questions to be answered in the future. And therefore, and, and nevertheless, this becomes, to our knowledge, Pakistan's first climate health and nutritional study that suggests the urgent need to understand the future implications of climate change on children's health. This study, again, is by no means a takeaway from the need to continue investment on other direct and indirect nutritional interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Horace, and uh, thank you for uh, rounding this off. Uh, we are actually at time, but I will uh, extend uh, uh, the session by a few minutes just to allow a few questions. I see that a large number of questions have been asked and answered in chat, uh, but there are a few that we could maybe focus on. Uh, so um, one of the questions, and Anil, you have asked about climate financing uh, uh, and uh, how this can be done. Uh, maybe I'll just pose it to all panel members and uh, and ask them if they have a clear idea as to how countries should prioritize investments in climate change mitigation. What is the process for various countries and particularly Pakistan to undertake a systematic process of creating a hierarchy of investments in this regards? given resource limitation and also the need to bring all stakeholders on board. So I'll uh, um, start with perhaps our first two speakers, uh, Marina and Tony and Tony Costello and see if you have any views and then we'll pass down the order. 
I can give perhaps uh, what would be our perspective, or at least my perspective, from the point of view of prioritizing health in this transition and ensuring that as we transition to a low carbon economy, we put health and health benefits at their center. And in that regard, one of the of the key elements that we're seeing is that the every transition that moves you away from the dirtiest forms of fuel, um, this has to do with coal, even with biomass burning, that perhaps is not the core priority in terms of decarbonization, but it's hugely detrimental in terms of land use change and also in terms of indoor air pollution. From us, from the health perspective, that is where the priorities have to be. And obviously taking into account the alternative transitions that you can do that are fairly low cost and that imply um, new technologies that people can take on board and that uh, offer uh, bigger benefits. For example, when you look at places like, um, well, like we see this very, very often in South America, where you have um, energy poverty in many places, people that don't have access to electric supply and use dirty sources of fuel as a consequence of that, transitioning towards um, affordable, lower carbon technologies, which are available, not only offers the opportunity of cleaner air, of uh, cleaner uh, and healthier lifestyles, but also offers them the opportunity of having access to, to electricity, which they need also for their cooking, their, their um, preservation of food. So it has co-benefits that go way beyond just the goal of decarbonization in terms of health and well-being. Johnny? Just on the finance issue, um, two people have in the chat have, you know, made reference to the historical inequity. You know, we've been burning carbon for the last 200 years, pretty much, for our benefit. And most uh, poorer countries have only been doing that for the last 50 years. So there's that uh, massive deficit. And then, you know, the Prime Minister of Barbados at COP stood up early on and said the wealthy countries have poured 25 trillion dollars into keeping their economies afloat uh with various financial crises but you can't find 100 billion annually which you promised seven years ago to repair loss and damage for poorer countries so there's massive inequities there's massive problems with the whole neoliberal economy and I completely agree with all of that. The only bit of hope that I took away from COP was the fact that there were a lot of corporates there and there were a lot of financial people there. And just reading the Financial Times and things like that, I get the impression that a lot of major companies and investment houses that manage trillions of dollars recognize that this is threatening their future as well. Now, maybe I'm being naive, but if that's true and that there is going to be a massive shift in financial flows away from fossil fuels and into investment, which will be a part of a green economy, there is some hope for us. But otherwise, I, um, I, the anger was palpable at Glasgow from many of the poorer countries that they're being shafted by the West and the North, and that, you know, that we just need to keep protesting about this. It's it's neo-colonialism, in a sense. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, let me pass to Dr. Razia, and, and maybe you could say something, Dr. Razia, on what can be done within health systems for mental health, which seems to be emerging as such a major consequence for climate change for young people, particularly. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Bhutta. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think uh, that is uh, a very big issue uh, these days in mental health and uh, uh, in intersectoral interventions, uh, the mental health is uh, inclusive of that mental health and uh, also the addiction. So, uh, and its relation to the climate change is uh, we are gradually coming to that uh, part. And at the Ministry of Health, there is uh, like a, a task force is already in uh, place uh, for uh, looking after. And we are working on these uh, strategies to uh, like uh, to uh, to prioritize the mental health issues of uh, the people who are affected by the climate, especially the migrant populations and the women and children. Well, thank you very much, Zafar. Any any thoughts on uh, the issues tabled? 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Buddha. I, I agree what uh, you know, uh, Anthony and other people have said. Uh, what I want to say, I think they have also touched upon that, is about the co-benefits. So the argument we are making about health co-benefit, the argument we should also make about infrastructure co-benefit and you know agricultural co-benefit and the what not, you know. So all the co-benefit argument and the reinvestment is is i think is one of the one of the major argument which we can make um, and um, reinvest and redevise our plan as how it should be uh, you know invested so they should be i mean one of the one of the uh, places where we can have more attraction of the finances is to co-benefits of um, investing in climate change Thank you. Horace, uh, uh, the finding from your study of uh, maybe a converse relationship with wasting is a bit counterintuitive. So my question to you is, <clears throat> how much of that finding is potentially dependent upon the statistical methodology used? I mean, you use Poisson regression, which you know is typically used for bivariate uh, kind of outcomes. If you use linear growth as a continuous variable, would would you still, or you know, wasting as a continuous variable, would you still find that association? That's that's a good point. So, uh, one of the things that we have to remember that we only have two time points. So, 2011, 2018, that significantly reduces our our power, statistical power. So, that is absolutely correct. That Poisson can lead to um, you know, in in sort of indirect results in that sense, but. Um, definitely when we look at other other methodology we, and when we just look at the statistical means, we do first of all see that statistically there is a significant rise in temperatures and of course stunting and wasting. So we just need to have sort of more statistical power and that will allow us to find better uh, results in the future. Yeah, and also <clears throat> for both, there may be subtle changes uh, with reductions of national heat in stunting, which you know to be the case in the North. Correct. Um, but for waste to wasting is a little bit more complex. But I'm just saying that and I think we probably need more analysis before coming to the definitive conclusion that there isn't an effect on wasting. So ladies and gentlemen, we are at time. We are actually over time, but I would like to thank you for a fantastic uh, series of presentations. This is just the beginning of our, our quest to get more discussion and dialogue on the whole issue of climate change and health and its uh, impact on livelihoods. One area that we haven't talked about in terms of health consequences of climate change is really, if you have such a huge impact on food production, on livelihoods, and on desertification of many parts of the country, it has an impact on population movement and migration. Uh, the whole uh, issue of people moving increasingly from many various parts of the world to big cities is also dependent upon their inability to sustain a livelihood. And that's also what's emerging from many other geographies where climate change is impacting lives, migration patterns, uh, also insecurity and conflict because it is a major driver of uh, poverty in many places. So I think in Pakistan, as Professor Costello mentioned, we need to have a broad multidimensional approach to how this can be uh, tackled. And that's one of the reasons why I think this needs to become a priority in terms of national planning, uh, not just through the relevant ministries, uh, but I think as uh, Madam Rufsana Naveed pointed out, this should become a very high profile issue at a political level in terms of how Pakistan is going to invest in this uh, in its future, because we will be one of the most affected countries of the world. And uh, irrespective of what optimism may be expressed by many other places, I don't think we're going to get the $100 billion that were promised. I, I don't think uh, we are going to see a lot of largesse coming from high-income countries to low-income countries. So increasingly, countries like Pakistan will have to develop local solutions and to look at how they can work in this space by allocating resources to principally strengthen their own resilience and response to this. And this seminar is probably one in the series that we will need to make that happen. So I'd like to thank the panelists. I'd like to particularly thank 
uh, SDPI for giving us the opportunity in their conference to uh, hold this uh, webinar. I'd like to thank Adam Oksana Naweed for her presence amongst us and for your thoughtful comments, Madam. I hope you will continue to remain engaged. Uh, uh, we need more parliamentarians interested in this space and a greater dialogue. And with that, I thank you and look forward to interacting in our future series of seminars. Thank you very much for your time. So before we sign Any closing out, comments, Uzma? Uh, yeah, just a little note before we sign out, uh, can we have a group photo with the cameras oh. on? All right. Okay, great. I'm game. Who's going to take it? I, I will, but anybody else can also. All right. I don't even know how to do that, but Masuma might, you might. Thank you. So I'll, I'm just going to click a photo. And another one. Thank you. It was a wonderful panel. Uh, great to listen to all the recommendations. There are a lot of uh, take home key messages, and we hope that we can continue on, on this dialogue in another webinar or a session in person, and maybe another session in, the, in our 25th Sustainable Development Conference. Thank you, uh, Marina and uh, Professor Costello. I've sent you a note on how we can actively collaborate with the Lancet countdown process, especially now with data being generated subnationally in Pakistan. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Have a nice Thank day. You. Thank you.